All right, so just a little bit of a recap um, from last week. Um, I probably didn't mention last week, but this is considered one of the historical books. So if you haven't seen this graphic before, it's kind of a, uh, a neat breakup of all the different categories, for lack of a better term, of all the books. All, how many books of the Bible are there? 66, written by how many authors? About 40 different authors over a period of, uh, this one I'm not 100% sure on, but maybe 3,500 years of, um, 3,500 years, uh, I think is what it would be closer. Um, wouldn't that be accurate, going all the way back to Genesis and Job? Well, 1,500 doesn't get us back to zero, uh, so you got to get, uh, no, a lot of them were written, well, pretty close, um, if we believe in the young earth theory. Yep. Right. So 30. F- yeah. So that's where roughly I was coming up with 2,000 since we're in 2018 plus the 1,500 B.C. That's 3,500 plus years uh, is, is where I was coming from. Uh, but you can see the Old Testament on the left, New Testament on the right. Uh, we're down in that second column or that first column, second row of history. You can see that First and Second Chronicles, then Ezra. Uh, so that's a, a book of history. Um, and so it's one of the historical books. Uh, we've obviously covered uh, Joshua, also a book of history, and we just came out of before that, uh, the, the book of Acts. So uh, how many people have seen a graphic similar to this before that kind of broke up all 66 books into categories? Yeah, so that's sometimes helpful to, to recognize that and see all the different letters, uh, so many of them that Paul wrote there. Uh, this book of Ezra is also uh, the first of the post-captivity books. So after they are coming out of their captivity of Babylon, this is the first of those books. Um, uh, two dramatic, or what's not, not dramatically, but f- immediately following Ezra would be the book of Esther or, and the book of Nehemiah. Um, so those two would be the two right after Ezra um, of the post-captivity books. I mentioned a little bit right before we played that song about the theme of this book. I, I'm, I wrote down here that it would be like encouraging others to obey God's word. So that's, that to me is kind of the theme of the whole book of Ezra, encouraging others to obey God's word. I mean, all the way through Ezra 1 through 6, it was just uh, encouragement trying to be given to give it to the people that came back with the first uh, Persian permission to come back from Babylon to Jerusalem with Zerubbabel. Uh, a big group of people, uh, they were encouraged to, to rebuild the temple. They got started, and then they got really discouraged, didn't they, because of all the people in the surrounding area that just really kind of emotionally and physically beat up on them, and they stopped building the temple for 14 years or so uh, before they ended up completing it. And uh, I threw in this other timeline last week, so I'll put it up while I talk about it just briefly. But all the way down there to the right, we have a uh, 456, 58 B.C., uh, which is where Ezra goes to Jerusalem. When we talked about uh, where this date came from, because King Artaxerxes is the ruler at this point now in Ezra chapter 7. His rule began in 464 B.C., and we're told in, I think, verse 8 of Ezra chapter 7 that Ezra left Babylon in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. So that gets us down to 458. Uh, And then much later, uh, many weeks from now, we're going to be getting into Nehemiah, and his return is going to take place in 444 B.C. His main task and goal is to come back and not rebuild the temple. The temple's already there and standing, and we're going to see after tonight's teaching that uh, the money has been given to Ezra for the beautification 
of the temple, but mostly the money is being given to Ezra, as we learned at the very end of last week's teaching, was for the worship ceremonies and worship needs of the temple. Uh, but some of that money was also meant for beautification because now the temple is roughly 60 years old at the time that Ezra arrives back in uh, Jerusalem. But Nehemiah is coming back to build the walls. And so that's an awesome book. Hopefully everybody can attend for that. So any comments or questions on the, the timeline there? A lot of different king's names. You know, we've got uh, Cyrus, uh, Darius I, uh, Remember, who was the king that we mentioned last week uh, that was between King Darius and King Artaxerxes? Yeah. Uh, I've heard it pronounced uh, Ahasuerus, or the other term is King Xerxes. Xerxes was the father of King Artaxerxes. So we're only one generation removed from the king that was in power during the time of the book of Esther which was King Xerxes. Um, all right, so that's kind of in the way of recap, uh, just kind of getting into where we're going to pick up now in verse 18 of Ezra chapter 7. So hopefully everyone has a, a Bible or a tablet or a phone to follow along with. If not, I'm going to have the verses up here on the screen, like 18 right now. So, and whatever it seems good to you and your brethren to do with the rest of the silver and the gold... Do it according to the will of your God. So remember, we're in the middle of a letter that King Artaxerxes has given to Ezra, basically to take back with him to Jerusalem. And he's going to be giving this letter to, and making sure that it's read and understood by the individuals that are already in Judah, uh, Jerusalem area. Because King Artaxerxes is wanting to make sure now that this temple is taken care of. And they're gonna, we're going to find out here in a few verses how much resources King Artaxerxes has uh, given. And not just resources, but authority that he's given to Ezra. And, um, so I'll save that till we get to that verse about how much authority. And this is really a, an awesome letter because if you really want to be encouraged, I mean, put yourself in the shoes of Ezra. Because you're going to see, reading through this letter, several, if four or five different times, the things that King Artaxerxes says to Ezra is very encouraging. One of them last week that we talked about was how King Artaxerxes just blessed Ezra in saying how great of a scribe he was and how learned he was as an, in, as an individual and as a scribe. And he just really elevated um, Ezra uh, and wanting him to go back and teach the people of Jerusalem the law of the Lord. So that's really Ezra's main focus, is to go back, teach the people the law of the Lord, and institute new reform to make sure that they start following the Lord wholeheartedly and that they continue doing it. So uh, this is a, so after reading this verse 18, uh, a continuing example of King Artaxerxes being very, very generous because he feels there is more than enough that is being given to Ezra for the worship needs of the temple. The worship needs of the temple, if you go back and read probably verses uh, 16 and 17, uh, you'll see uh, the three different offerings, essentially, that were taken up. And remember, one of them was from uh, the king himself, uh, and another one was from the, in, the Persian people from Babylon, and then also one from the Jewish people that remained in Babylon. So there's basically three different collections that were spoken of in the uh, first half of this letter that we talked about and read about last week. So all that information, all that resources was given for the worship needs of the temple that he has given Ezra permission to do with the silver and gold as he directed. So again, he's just kind of telling Ezra how what the money should be used for, but he's not... Um, telling him exactly how to use it. He wants him to use it to buy the, the lambs and the bullocks and the goats and so forth for worship and the, 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 the wheat and the oil for the offerings and salt that we're going to see here in a little bit. Just everything that he needs to purchase for the worship ceremonies in the temple is what the king is providing for. And then in verse 9 we see in the letter he writes, Also the articles that are given to you for the service of the house of your God Deliver in full before the God of Jerusalem. 
so these articles uh, that caught my, my attention when I was reading through this uh, book again, this verse again, uh, and I believe they're the rest of the artifacts from the first temple, meaning Solomon's temple, uh, that were brought from Jerusalem to Babylon, uh, basically by King Nebuchadnezzar. And it says the words, deliver in full. So, again, no words are in there for no specific reason. They're there for a purpose, meaning that the other time that Zerubbabel came back, that there was some utensils and artifacts brought back then, but not everything. Uh, if you're in earlier chapters of Ezra, you know, it counted out all the different thousands of pieces uh, that were given, but for whatever reason, not everything was loaded up and brought back in that first uh in gathering back to Jerusalem. So here it says in full. So that's um, to me saying, wow, they, they went through the artifacts in the, uh, in the basement, in the garages all around the Babylon there and in the temple's uh, basement. You know, I mean, in the per King Persia, his basement area. And they found everything that they had set aside from uh, Jerusalem and uh, gave them to Ezra this time to take back. But also remembering back in Ezra chapter 5, uh, verses 14 and 15, it says, also there it mentions these vessels, and it uses a Hebrew word for article or vessel. In Ezra chapter 6, verse 5, it, it mentions of the gold and silver articles of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took from the temple. So in chapter 5 and chapter 6, it mentions these articles. And then it's interesting that the Hebrew word for vessel is only used seven times uh, in the whole Bible, and all seven instances are here in the book of Ezra and in Daniel. And all seven instances are referring to the items taken from Solomon's temple. So I'm not a, a Hebrew scholar uh, by any stretch of the mean. I just happened to look up that word. And it's interesting that it's only used in reference to the artifacts taken from Solomon's temple. And it's only in these two books, Ezra and Daniel. The vessels, yep. Yeah, so articles is more of an uh, English term, I guess, but the, the, ve the term vessel, yes. And notice here, I've underlined it, the word your. Uh, King Artaxerxes uh, says your God, and I'm just going to point that out now because we're going to come across it three or four more times just in the finishing up of this um, chapter. So it's just interesting to note that uh, King Artaxerxes was very helpful towards Ezra, uh, recognizing the fact that the God of Israel was not the God of King Artaxerxes, uh, but he was very, very helpful. Verse 20, and whatever more may be needed for the house of your God, which you may have a occasion to provide, pay for it from the king's treasury. So again, wow, the king, this King Artaxerxes keeps pouring out the blessings to Ezra. He says, whatever else you may need, let the expenses be paid out of the king's treasury. Uh, Ezra has essentially, you know, what you might call a, a royal blank check uh, to do with uh, however he sees fit all of this stuff, the silver and gold that he's taken back with him from Babylon. And notice once again, King Artaxerxes says, your God. Verse 21. And I, even I, Artaxerxes the king, issue a decree to all the treasurers who are in the region beyond the river that whatever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of God of heaven, may require of you, let it be done diligently. So this is who this letter is uh, meant to be read in front of, to be presented to the treasurers on the other side of the river uh, that um, Ezra is going to see. King Artaxerxes is speaking to his tax collectors, essentially, uh, that whatever Ezra needs, they are pro to provide it to Ezra. So again, a, a blank check. But there's going to be some limits put on what Ezra can actually uh, ask for. And that's what we're going to see here in verse 22. Up to, so he says, give everything to Ezra that Ezra wants, up to, so here's the limits, 100 talents of silver, 100 cores of wheat, 100 baths of wine, 100 baths of oil, and salt without prescribed limit. So a talent. I was just talking to Craig here a minute ago before, the, before we got started. And a talent is a, a measure of weight. And depending on what resource you may be looking at, uh, the rough 
estimate of what a talent is is about 75 pounds. So 100 talents of silver is 7,500 pounds, just shy of 8,000 pounds, right? 8,000 pounds would be four tons of silver. So that's quite a bit. Uh, 100 cores of wheat. Um, how many uh, can relate back to maybe grandpa and grandma's house or maybe your house? Did you ever have a bushel basket around? So how, how, how would you put your arms around a bushel basket? How big is that? So that's one bushel. So a core of, yeah, that was a core of wheat. It was basically a bushel. But he gets 100 cores of wheat, so that's about 600 bushels. I'm sorry, one core is like six bushels. So that's why 100 cores is 600 bushels. And then 100 baths of wine is also equivalent to 600 gallons. And 100 baths of oil, also 600 gallons. Uh, I think I had a should have had that up there while I was talking. Um, so this is the uh, rough estimates of what all these different measurements are. So it's not a huge amount that he could really ask for. 600 bushels isn't a, a lot. I mean, if you've ever been out on a farm and done some combining and see corn going back up into a big truck or wheat or oats being combined and putting into the back of a truck, I'm sure one of those hauling trucks that I used to drive and combine with out in South Dakota uh, that probably holds, I'm guessing, a lot more than 600 bushels. Uh, so, uh, and 600 gallons, though, that is quite a bit. I happened to look that up just to, to get a rough frame of reference. Uh, the average bathtub in your house, if it's not one of the deep tubs, but just maybe uh, 32 inches wide or so and 60-some inches long and standard depth, that's about 80 gallons. If you happen to have one that's a little bit deeper, uh, you know, it's got the water jets in it. That might go up to 110 gallons. So just imagine six big bathtubs full of wine or six big bathtubs full of oil. So that's 600 gallons roughly to, put your, to be able to kind of wrap your head around how much that is. But then salt without limit. Why was salt prescribed without limit? Well, salt was needed for pretty much all the offerings at the temple. Uh, it was a very, very much used as a preservative with the food, but it was also, at, at this present day, pretty cheap. Um, so he wasn't worried about giving away too much of the salt. Uh, but it was needed for quite a few or all the different offerings in the temple, uh, seasoning your food and preserving your food. Um, so it, it, was, it was cheap and um, needed for so many different things. And I'm guessing maybe being close, so, so close to the, the Dead Sea, Salt Sea, I'm sure they uh, were able to harvest salt from there whenever needed. Uh, I'm not sure if anywhere else in the region they would have been able to get salt uh, as readily as from there. Verse 23. Whatever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it diligently be done for the house of the God of heaven. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? So King Artaxerxes is really trying to make sure he's doing everything right for Ezra to make sure the Persian government is not looked poorly upon. I alluded to this uh, last week, and I still didn't do any much more digging into it because I think it was, I, I know there's historical references to it about during this period there was uh, civil unrest going around, uh, not just in Jerusalem area, but in, mostly in the area of Assyria, north and east of where Jerusalem is now, and in Egypt um, at the time, back, back then. So in 450, 460 B.C., uh, there were wars going on or just coming to the conclusion of those wars. So King Artaxerxes was really trying to keep the peace, essentially, with all the people kind of on the outstretches of his, of his realm, essentially. You know, on the other side of the river, he calls it. Um, maybe areas that he doesn't have as many... Uh, treasurers and people t uh, over there watching over the land. But he just wanted to make sure that where Ezra was going was still part of his kingdom, essentially, but he wanted to just uh, make everybody happy. Um, so he was uh, willing to make some concessions, and he wanted uh, people to speak, speak highly, I guess, of him and the, the Persians, um, that he was willing to uh, give Ezra pretty much anything he needed. And really, when you look at those numbers back on the previous slide, 
uh, this is probably just a drop in the bucket of everything that uh, he had available to him in his kingdom. Uh, just like in present day, you know, we got the, the tariff war that's speculating that might happen uh, if these tariffs go into place that Trump wants to do and China wants to do. But China has already uh, speculated that they're going to put tariffs on roughly $3 billion of um, stuff that they import here. But $3 billion is also just a, a teeny tiny drop in the bucket of all the different monies that are uh, transferred between the two biggest economies in the world. Uh, so that's not a, it sounds like a lot, but in the scheme of things, money-wise, it's not a lot. Just like these things here is probably not a huge amount, but to Ezra and the people in Jerusalem and the people that need it for temple worship and so forth, this probably is quite a bit. All right, verse 24. Also, we inform you that it shall not be lawful to impose tax, tribute, or custom on any of the priests, Levites, singers, gatekeepers, Nethanim, or servants of this house of God. So King Artaxerxes is saying that all the returnees to Jerusalem are to be free of all taxes and tributes. So can you imagine if you were to go into the city that you live, uh, if I were to go back to Jer um, <laughs> Greensboro, and you were to go back into the city limits of Kernersville and you see a sign on the side of the road and said, hey, by the way, from, from this day forth, you don't have to pay taxes anymore. So the next paycheck you get is going to be 25, 30% larger because you're not getting um, you know, city tax, state tax, federal tax, FICA tax, all those different things getting taken out of it now. So all these individuals, no more tax or tribute or customs to be applied to any of these returnees to Jerusalem. So that's another huge uh, benefit for these individuals. Verse 25. And you, Ezra, according to your God-given wisdom, set magistrates and judges who may judge all the people who are in the region beyond the river, all such as know the laws of your God, and teach those who do not know them. So King Artaxerxes is emphasizing to Ezra to instruct and teach those that don't know the law of God. This actually was the duty anyway of the Levites, was to teach the law of the Lord to individuals. In our present day, it would be the elders in our current church setting uh, to teach the people the will and the law of the Lord. So basically to take care of the spiritual aspects of the church is kind of what we think of uh, what the elders should truly be responsible for doing. And that was what the Levites were responsible for doing. Uh, and just uh, the counterpart of that would be, you know, you know, you can go and read in First Timothy if you want the the responsibilities, for instance, of the of the bishops, the elders, and the responsibilities of the deacons. So the deacons, uh, we've heard it mentioned from stage, you know, their primary responsibility is helping and taking care of uh, the physical aspects of the church whereas the elders take care of the spiritual aspects of the church, if you want to kind of simplify it into two short definitions. And remember from, we talked about last week, you know, it mentions the Nethanim. Uh, the Nethanim were the Levitical deacons, uh, would be a, a, an easy way to, to remember and think of them. They were the, the, the helpers for the Levites, so they were the, the water carriers, the gatherers uh, for the Levites, anything that needed to be done uh, running errands and so forth, those were the, the people group, a subgroup of the Levites called the Nethanim. So the king supposes that this would be a good thing for Ezra to go back to Jerusalem and teach all the people the law of the Lord. Um, and that could be a benefit basically to the king's whole kingdom if all the people across the river, you know, as it says here, beyond the river, he keeps using that phrase, if they were more like Ezra, that would be a good thing, he thinks. So yeah, Ezra, go back and here's some money and here's some stuff to take back with you and teach all your people the, the law of the Lord, the will of the Lord. Um, and he was all for it. And he was uh, expecting that to be a, a great thing for, uh, for Ezra and the people of Jerusalem and a side benefit, good for his kingdom. And notice again, uh, we have King Artaxerxes says, your God, once again. Verse 26. Whoever will not observe the law of your God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed speedily on him, whether it be death or banishment or confiscation of goods or imprisonment. Wow. So now King Artaxerxes 
is giving Ezra the authority to punish, even up to using or imposing the death penalty on people if they don't obey the law of the Lord, the law of God, and of the king. So basically, he wants the people to know how to worship their God. He wants, essentially, if to put it in the present-day vernacular, vernacular uh, he wants the people to be praying at every football game and every basketball. And he's saying to them, basically, you all must be standing up when you pray. No kneeling down. <laughs> he wants prayers at all college graduations. Uh, he wants all the trash out of the TV programs and out of the movies. That's kind of what he's saying. He wants Ezra to go back and reform these individuals and help them uh, worship the Lord and be more worshipful in everything that they do. And anyone that does not do these things, wow, he's saying you can uh, ex execute them. You know, they can be put to death. They can be banished from the city. Uh, their goods can be confiscated or they can be imprisoned. So quite a bit of authority and power also being given to Ezra here by King Artaxerxes. And again, he says, your God in this passage. Verse 27 says, Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers, who has... So now we're... I think we're done with the letter now. This is Ezra uh, speaking here. Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers, who has put such a thing as this in the king's heart, to beautify the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. So only God could put all these remarkable things towards Ezra in the heart of King Artaxerxes. In addition to providing for the items needed for the worship in the temple, as I alluded to, uh, King Artaxerxes also allowed for the beautification of the whole ho house of the Lord. It even says it right there, to beautify the house. Uh, remember that the second temple was built, constructed, finished nearly 60 years ago. So I'm sure there was some physical maintenance that was uh, needing to be done on the temple. Um, probably a lot of us are not living in houses that are 60 years old. Uh, I know after 15, 20 years, there starts to be visible signs of wear and tear on a lot of houses. Usually the shingles uh, is maybe a, a, the first physical representation. Uh, maybe some siding issues or... Uh, Mike can probably speak to this a lot better than I about some of the immediate physical things, but uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, you're starting to see uh, physical degradation of the materials used to build our house. Um, 60 years now of the temple being built, uh, you probably wouldn't see too much wood, except I'm thinking most of it was made out of stone, uh, so you might see some wood on the inside, uh, and that probably doesn't see the elements like if it was on the outside. So inside the temple was probably pretty good, but still the, the stone construction, maybe some masonry joints or um, leaking a little bit of water or something, who knows. But he says, go ahead and beautify the house with some of the, the money that we're giving you, some of the gold and silver that you're taking back with you, and from the gold and silver there and stuff that you can ask from the people over on that side of the river. Uh, the king also may have been referring to restoring the, the moral and the spiritual life of the people in Jerusalem. So by beautifying the house, maybe not just physically, as I just got done alluding to, that was my first implication or first understanding, uh, but it also he could have been alluding to the moral, moral and spiritual life of the people in Jerusalem, which he's already tasked Ezra with doing, because he said, when you go back, I want you being such the great scribe and knower of the law and the will of God, teach those, teach that to the people in Jerusalem. And finally, verse 28. Let's see how it finishes in verse 27. Uh, to beautify the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem and has extended mercy to me before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty princes. So I was encouraged as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me and I gathered leading men of Israel to go up with me. So Ezra really felt the mercy that was extended towards him. Truly, Ezra was blessed by King Artaxerxes, and Ezra was just recognizing it. So it's good for us to recognize when we're truly being blessed. You know, in your prayer time, uh, open up and just say, thank you, Lord, for this. Thank you, Lord, for that. And Ezra is essentially doing that now, thanking a heathen king for helping him so much. 
and he knew that the only reason that he was getting extended this type of mercy is because what we saw back in verse 27, it must have been God that put all of these awesome, wonderful things in the heart of the king to do it towards Ezra. So three times Ezra stated that the hand of the Lord my God was upon me. Um, he mentions it here, and last week I mentioned the other two times where he said that the hand of the Lord was upon me. And that was Ezra just recognizing that, I used the word miracles last week, you know, how Ezra was really remembering and emphasizing and thanking God uh, of the miraculous things that the king did for him and how he knew that it must have been at the hand and will of the Lord. So to summarize uh, with a, a final life lesson here, or the only life lesson for tonight, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, and His mercies endures, endure forever. So, you know, in that last verse 28, it talked about, you know, Ezra really felt that the mercy was extended to him. And it just reminded me of that uh, another verse in Scripture that just says, His mercies endure forever. And then, just borrowing from a life lessons from last week is the bottom half of this, where it says, The God of Israel is faithful to His promises. He will completely restore His people when they come back to him. So just kind of meditate on that for a little bit. Uh, we all need to think about and come back to him on occasion. I mean, how many times have we uh, said the wrong thing, done the wrong thing, not been the right example that we should have been to a child, to a spouse, to a co-worker? Um, luckily, we don't get exiled. At least I haven't heard of anybody recently of getting exiled out of your home or out of your workplace. Well, I guess some people have got exiled from their workplaces in the last several years. You know, that's called downsizing. Um, but it doesn't happen usually that easily or that quickly. Well, even in the time of uh, Jerusalem, when they were exiled, it took three different banishments, essentially, starting in 722 B.C. all the way down to 586 B.C., so that's a long time there where they just continually, continually, continually did the wrong thing, didn't obey the Lord. And in, in my language, you know, he just, Lord finally had enough and allowed them to be taken into captivity. And then it took another 70 years for them to uh, kind of repent. And it was finally, it was prophesied that it would take 70 years for them to, to come, to be allowed to come back into the land, essentially. Um, but in my, in my reading uh, in the morning now, I'm reading through the Bible, and uh, I've, I'm into the, the book of Judges now, and you start to see the up and down pattern of the Judges ruling. I haven't got to the first king yet, but even just through the period of Judges, there's people that are, you know, it didn't take long after Joshua, <laughs> where after Joshua and the elders that were around at the time of Joshua, they obeyed the Lord. They did everything. They followed his commandments. And then after those elders and Joshua had passed away off the scene, they immediately started doing things wrong again and worshiping the Baals and the other uh, people of the land that they hadn't, ex or they hadn't conquered and kicked out yet. So you read, finish through the, that book of Joshua and then into Judges and uh, you know, they're, they're great. They have a, a judge leading them for uh, anywhere 16, 20, 30 years, and then that judge dies, and then they go into a period of decline for 18, 20, 40 years, and then a judge is risen up again, and then they're all uh, happy-go-lucky and following the Lord for another 30, 40 years, and it's a constant up and down, up and down through all those judges, and then we're going to see the same thing when they finally get kings as well. It's going to be really good for uh, a King Solomon, not so good for King Solomon's son. Well, I, mean, I guess before that was King David. King David was good. King Solomon was good to the very end. And then after King Solomon and his first son, it just started going downhill from there. And especially in the northern kingdom, I'm just giving you a big history lesson here now, um, it was just nothing but bad kings there. At least in the southern kingdom, they had some good kings along the way. Uh, but if you kind of graph it, good king, bad king, good king, Good king, bad king. It's just like a, a sawtooth uh, on a big, long saw, up and down, up and down, up and down. 
I say all that just to come back to this phrase here. He will completely restore his people when they come back to him. So when there was the bad things going on, people weren't seeking the Lord. Uh, and so the Lord was letting them kind of have their way, essentially. And then finally, when they called out to the Lord, is what it says in, in Judges, they, he waits for them to do that, and then what? God raises up a judge, and God raises up a king. Um, but they needed to be restored, so they cried out to the Lord, and then the Lord honored that at that point in time. So if you haven't read the book of Judges, um, uh, it, it's a pretty cool book and how it goes into First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. Um, just an awesome history lesson there through all those books as well. Uh, but just how faithful and then unfaithful and faithful people can be. It's just ridiculous how they can go from having an awesome king to the very next generation is a 180 degree flip flop. Um, and it, so, again, go ahead. It's it's humorous almost uh, to, to read through there, and, and see the behavior of the Israelites when they had been given so much, especially after in the book of Joshua that we're just reading through and what they saw, uh, even going through the wilderness, the miracles there, and and man, so, yeah, Bruce. I would have to say yes. I mean, we even saw that with King David. Uh, if you read through uh, that, the, that story, that lineage, he, well, I guess King David came after the judges that we're talking about, but you certainly see it with King David, how the many sons that he had, unfortunately, from many wives. Uh, so even King David, a, God after man, a guy, a man after God's heart, if I'm saying that right, uh, you know what I mean, uh, he was told through Scripture not to have many wives, but he did. And his son Solomon was not to multiply wives and horses, but he did. But you're right. Uh, the parents were not doing their job. So we'll go back even further into the book of Judges in time before King David. Yeah, it had to be the parents not passing on the, the knowledge and the wisdom that they were supposed to. Um, do we still see that today? Absolutely. Um, you, you can see it. Walking around the halls of this church sometimes, I, I can't, nothing's coming to mind as far as examples, but I'm sure you can see examples of, of parents, and then their children are, are quite a bit different. But if they're really young, it's kind of understandable. They haven't really had a, a, a great opportunity to learn and see the example for many years. I'm talking real young. Once they get this tall, they should know better. Um, but you get the idea that parents really need to be uh, more emphatic with their training uh, nowadays than ever before because of the, the influences of social media and TV uh, are so much more powerful, I guess, than they've ever been before. Uh, but you're right. Um, parents need to really play a, a role in raising up, uh, was it Psalm 22, 6? Uh, train up a child in the way he should go. So we need to, is that the Proverbs 22, 6? <laughs> it's close. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Proverbs 26. So, yeah.